Hello and welcome to this, the very final match of GP Sydney. On the left of our screen, that's Jan Cassander of the Czech Republic. His very first Pro Tour will be next weekend at Pro Tour Eldritch Moon. On the other side of things, Scott Lipp, who finished top of the Swiss in this tournament. And both these players, quite different decks, Frank Carsten, and they are now ready to play for the trophy here in Australia. Yes, indeed. This will be a matchup between Scott Lipp's super aggressive white green deck who's starting off with a fine two-drop in Noose Constrictor, uh, semi-wild mongrel reincarnation, now complete with uh, Reach. Jan Ksander playing a bit of a more controlling deck with uh, lots of heavy-hitting mythics for, uh, for the late game. What he is uh, looking to set up is, well, either an Ember Cool, the promised end in the very late game, or perhaps uh, a Tamiyo Field Researcher as a nice Planeswalker. But he will be on the defensive early on. If the game goes long, Jan is favored, but uh, Scott Lips is set up to play creatures early on, pump them, and hopefully finish off the game in short order. So far, Scott has hit his curve after a mulligan with News Constrictor and Blood Briar. So things are uh, going as planned for Scott Lips so far. Uh, Thraben Gargoyle, Gargoyle, the only play for Jan Cassander thus far, elected not to, well, force a discard probably from Scott Lip early on rather than even getting the trade by blocking the news constrictor. Just passing things back here. I mean, his control deck, not as replete with creatures. He's making up for it by having a little bit in the way of removal and sp sp spells to work with. But right now, kind of taking things a little easy, that d is, of course, going to cost him a little bit in terms of life. Looks like, like there are no blocks for Jan Xander, who is struggling a bit to find his uh, footing in this game. Hasn't uh, produced a relevant blocker yet, not for the Noose Constrictor and the Bloodbriar. And now there's also a Backwood Survivalist entering the battlefield. Just a 4-3. Hey, it becomes bigger when you have Delirium, but Scott Lip is uh, typically trying to have locked up the game before he even comes close to Delirium. Although, thanks to two copies of Lunark Mantle in his deck, he is able to achieve Delirium in the mid to late game if it comes to that. Yeah, I mean, even... Even here, just as the 4-3, it's pretty good. Does gain Trample as well when Delirium is active, but right now it's simply the biggest body on the board, and that's going to be enough to make Jan Kassanda have pause here. Just the Thraven Gargoyle for him thus far. And you can see him there just checking out his hand. I mean, the one thing that you do have when you've not played very many spells is plenty of cards to look at in your hand. And Gavany Unhallowed there as a 2-4 actually is a pretty reasonable blocker in this state. And now there might be more of an inclination for him to trade that Thraven Gargoyle for something because when it dies, on top of getting two card types in the graveyard, he's going to get a plus one, plus one counter on that zombie. Now Scott will still be able to uh, attack with pretty much all of his creatures. The worst that uh, may happen is say that, well, Jan, for example, double blocks the 4-3 the the survivalist with uh, both of his creatures. That's not too bad for Scott. Alternatively, uh, Jan could block the news constrictor with Gavany on Hello. That will force a double discard from Scott, which is not great. If Scott is not willing to uh, offer up the double discard, attacking with the Blood Briar is also not going to achieve all that much because Jan can just uh, block it with uh, Gavany on Hello. So just an attack with the Backwoods Survivalist today. So Jan Cassander dropping 10 life here and having to just look on as Scott Lip goes searching for a human on the top of his deck here. And that's a courageous outrider. Well, misses. And it's still a 3-4 for 4, so it's not as if Scott Lip here has played a particularly embarrassing creature, even in spite of not getting to draw a card. Well, there's a planes for uh, Jan Xander, so he actually has access to uh, mana for Tamiyo in case he uh, would find one. But so far what uh, Jan needs to uh, do in order to claw back into this game is to uh, put down a big blocker. Five mana. And the young player from the Czech Republic has a pretty good one in terms of putting down blockers and indeed dealing with what's coming from the other side of things. That a dark salvation to make two zombies. In total, three zombies in play. That means minus three, minus three for the big four three on Scott Lip's side of the board. Killing a creature, making a couple of blockers. This is how Jan Cassander is getting back in this game. Yeah, this is an excellent way to uh, to get there. All of those creatures he gained will also be able to, well, after they trade, grow that uh, Gavany unhallowed. 
So that is the, the perfect card for the situation. Dark Salvation, uh, one of the better rares in Eldritch Moon. First pick, first pack, I think you just take this over any common or uncommon. Look here, it provided 4 power, 4 toughness, and dealt with a 4 tree on the other side of the board. That's an amazing deal for 5 mana. Yeah, and now Scott Lip kind of just having to regroup a little bit, figure out what he's going to do. Uh, plays a Woodland Patrol. That not necessarily going to do too much in the short term, but extra bodies on the board never going to hurt. Yeah, and eventually Scott may be able to uh, start attacking with all of his creatures, threaten some kind of uh, pump spell. There is uh, a nice card in Eldritch Moon, Borrowed Grace, that can uh, give all creatures plus two plus two for five mana. However, looking at uh, Scott Lip's deck list, looks like he didn't pick up any of them. Only uh, pump spells that target a single creature. Yeah, but something like Woodcutter's Grit could potentially punish almost any kind of blocking that's going on for Jan Cassander. Uh, giving Hexproof and plus three plus three is a big deal. Stitchwing Scab the play, though, for Cassander, and unfortunately for him, he's facing down that uh, Constrictor on the other side of the board, which does have reach. Mm -hmm. Well, Jan is uh, perfectly content to just uh, sit back for now and defend. If Scotlip would eventually down the road trade his news constrictor for the Stitchwing Scarp, it can just uh, come back from the graveyard. Oh, and it would also put a counter on the Gavany on Hallowed, so that's not too bad. Aha, uh -huh, so this will entrap it Provisioner. That'll turn the Courageous Outrider into a 5 6. And now Jan Cassander will have a tough decision to make. He could just take the damage because the boost is only temporarily for this turn, but then he would fall down to 5 life. That is. Uh, kind of dangerous. Alternatively, well, he could just jump block it, I guess, but uh, that's not going to be that smart of a decision because the Intrepid Provisioner also gives uh, Trample. There is a Tamiyo uh, in or, or, or never mind. The Intrepid Provisioner has Trample by itself. It doesn't actually give Trample. Um, alternatively, Jan can just line up a triple block, say with a zombie, a zombie, and a Traven Gargoyle, thereby taking down the Courageous Outrider and putting a lot of counters on the Gavinion on Hallowed goes just for the chum block with the Stitchwing Scab that can come back from the graveyard. Fair enough. Protecting his life total in a situation like this makes a lot of sense. So Tambio is in Yang Sander's hand. That an option available to him. He does have the mana to cast her. You could potentially play her minus two to tap a couple of non-land permanents, in this case creatures, because that's pretty much all Scott Lip has beyond his lands. Uh, and they wouldn't untap during the next untap step, so he could kind of offer himself a little bit of time that way. Alternatively, I think there are a few other cards in, in Jan Cassander's hand as he builds up his mana base, all those options coming available to him. Yeah, as the game progresses, that Gavany Unhallowed may get out of hand, and Scott Lip doesn't really have many good uh, ways in his deck to deal with it. I don't see a choking restraints in his uh, in his deck list. He has two copies of Prey Upon, but that's a damage based removal spell, which is not going to help much against a high toughness blocker. So currently already the Gavany on Hello 3-5 can profitably block all of Scott Lip's creatures. And there's a Toot Collector added to the battlefield. Yeah, not able to actually kill anything off right here, but at least in principle, if it works out that Delirium comes along, it will be able to provide a consistent source of shrinking of creatures. And Scott Lip will have some things in his deck that are going to really feel it when they lose a point of power and indeed toughness for a turn. So now Scott Lip has Confront the Unknown in his hand. That is the green combat trick that would give, well, plus one, plus one to a creature. Not really the big boost that he needs to uh, to break through. Even uh, his uh, biggest three power creature with that uh, plus one plus one boost cannot attack into the Gavany Unhallowed. So Scott unfortunately just has to uh, sit back and pass the turn as Jan Xander <laughs> discards Embercool. Maybe this Rise from the Tides uh, play that you mentioned earlier, we might be seeing that. A rise from the grave here would be absolutely colossal. Uh, it would be just a dream come true, <laughs> a nightmare come true for someone. Um, Stitchwin Scab, in the meanwhile, is just a perfectly serviceable creature that can actually prove relevant on this board, getting stuck in. There are no flyers for Scott Lip. All he has going on, if he wants to block, is Noose Constrictor, and it looks like he elects not to here. 
post-combat. Here we have it. Yours? Rise from the grave. <laughs> Emrakul in play. 1313 flying trample. Protection from instant. So it's not to say that Scott Lip has zero opportunity <laughs> to deal with Emrakul. But Emrakul in play. Certainly a problem for pretty much any deck in pretty much any format. Flying trample. Yeah, I looking at Scott Lip's li deck list, I don't see uh, a way out of this. Not here. There's a, <laughs> a lone rider, well, that's just a very lone creature in the face of this uh, monstrous Emrakul. Awesome to see it in the finals of this uh, GP here. Beautiful to uh, see the combination between just some discard effects and that uh, rise from the grave. Wow. 13-13, trample, flying. I don't think Scott Lip uh, will be able to beat this one. I think Liliana would approve of <laughs> doing this with Emrakul once you've dealt with Emrakul. Additionally, Emrakul is now a black zombie. <laughs> wow, the irony. Yeah, I'm not sure what uh, Liliana would uh, would say of that indeed, but one way or another, Jan is ahead in the tentacle game. And here's Tamio. Because why not? Might Insult, <laughs> injury, I have all of these things. Please enjoy them. This is like a, a story element game where all of the main players from the Eldritch Moon story come out on the battlefield to uh, have their have their say. Flavor-wise, I'm not convinced that this way that they play out is quite the way that they go in the in the story section on the Magic the Gathering website. You might have to just <laughs> read up on that one to make sure. No, for that I think Scott has to play an island and then imprisoned in the moon, but I don't think that's going to happen. So Scott Lip untaps here. What's he going to do about all this gas? Well, he's going to scoop up his cards and say, on to game two. Jan Cassander turning things around there in basically the most exciting possible <laughs> way. Yeah. I'm going to call it right now. Rise in the grave on Emrakul. Just what awesome. more could we ask for? I mean, I could ask for the, the Mind Slaver trigger, but yeah, you don't get that one when you don't actually cast Emrakul. Then again, even without that, well, there, there's not much uh, that... Uh, could have gone better for uh, Jan Sander. It looked like he was super far behind early on as Scott Lip hit his curve, had creatures on turn two, on turn three, on turn four. Jan had only just a two to the, the Traben Gargoyle on the battlefield. Wasn't able to line up any blocks. I, uh, I thought Scott Lip was definitely going to uh, take that game early on, but well, first the Dark Salvation, which was a huge swing providing uh, both the removal spell and a lot of power on, uh, on the battlefield so that uh, Jan could line up some blocks. And that allowed him to stabilize for long enough to uh, set up that awesome uh, combination. You see the, the smile on his face. He is, well, he's happy, not just uh, because he, uh, well, is in the finals of a GP one game up, but also because uh, the cards he put in his deck, probably with this idea in the back <laughs> of his mind, like, hey, maybe I'll uh, reanimate Emrakul. It's all coming uh, together Achievement beautifully. unlocked. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's it's not very often that you see a blue-black deck with Tamiyo in play. It's not very often that you see any deck with Emrakul in play. <laughs> very happy to see Yankasander achieving both of those things in the final of this GP. And potentially, you know, he could do it again. We've got one more game at least in this finals. Yankasander, of course, will be very happy if it does work out. There's only one more game because that would mean that he's the victor. Scott Lip, he's going to have to win two on the bounce if he's going to take the trophy. These players both looking at their sideboards. And it looks like Jan Cassander got some fairly substantial sideboarding going on here. I mean, one thing when you have a couple of copies of Terrarian in your deck is that there are more options. Even even the things like the Prey Upon that didn't make his main deck that's a little bit tricky to cast in game one. Well, you know, he could look into that potentially. Um, he's got all sorts of options and he's certainly going to make sure that all of them are considered. Meanwhile, I've been looking at Scott, L Scott Lip's deck list, also at his sideboard to... Uh, check out if there's any answer to uh, an early Embercool. I don't see uh, anything really. So Scott Lip will just have to uh, go for his original game plan of presenting a fast clock, playing some pump spells and hoping that it uh, works out at least before that uh, big bad Embercool comes down. Now in the meantime, Jan Xander may be interested in uh, boarding in some, uh, some early creatures if he has uh, some left in his uh, sideboard. Don't really see many, perhaps Enlightened Maniac just as a jump blocker and something to trade because he needs all the defense he can uh, he can get against the powerful aggro deck from uh, from Scott Lip. 
I'm sad to say that Scott Lipp doesn't have the ultimate in flavor fail enchantments to deal with Emrakul in choking restraints. I can't quite imagine how you would choke out Emrakul. <laughs> it's not something that Scott Lipp's going to have available to him, though. Those things tend to get snapped up pretty early in drafts, and even though Scott's in white, he does not have any of them available to him in his 40 or indeed in his sideboard, though. Frankly, that's not one that you tend to see in many sideboards. Scott Lipp taking a mulligan here. One, once again, you also had to uh, go down to six in the first game. Well, that's just uh, the, the danger of building an aggressive deck. You don't always have a good curve early on, and then you're just forced to take a mulligan. Then again, it's also excellent card selection in search of uh, a fast draw. Meanwhile, looks like uh, Jan Xander is uh, happy with his seven-card opening hand. He, he cannot hide his, uh, his excitement. See that smile on uh, Jan Xander's face. I think I'd feel the same way. I think I'd have a, a big silly grin on my face for the entirety mm -hmm. of the final. I would be sad that Scott Lipp was the one that picked up Tamio's journal during this draft rather <laughs> than me because I wanted to put together the most crazy sort of flavor sandwich that you're ever going to have to put together. Yeah, flavor points don't really count for uh, winning uh, a GP, but it's, it's, it's a nice bonus, that's for sure. Especially in this first weekend where we get to see Eldritch Moon cards in action. It's out on Magic Online now, so it's uh, an awesome format. Hall of Famer Ben Stark has called it uh, in uh, the best draft formats he's had over the course of the last five years. So join in on the fun. Maybe you'll open Evercool as well. All right, so just an equipment on turn two for Scott Lip, but it will mean that each of his creatures are a little bit more threatening. Uh, not the fastest. It takes a full three to equip for the plus two, plus two on that cultist stuff. I, have we got a creature on turn three? It's looking like we haven't, and that potentially opening the door for Jan Cassander to be a bit freer about sort of just yeah. gradually building his board without worrying his life, and has a Skizdag supplicant there. And still a creature came down. Dr Drug School shield mate, two, three flash, it's uh, at least a creature on turn three that may carry an equipment. And with that equipment, it would turn into uh, a four five, which can attack into the Scourge deck supplicant. Kind of like playing the flash creature end of turn there. It just means that there was less opportunity for Yank Sander to kill it off. It did give uh, other creatures, uh, if, if Scott Lip had any, they would have got uh, plus one toughness. A two three for three though, with flash pretty solid, just even as the first creature you play in the game. Well, looks like Scott Lip wants to uh, use his mana for something else this turn. So he's just attacking with uh, the Shieldman. Now he has some pump spells in his deck that he uh, could use in case uh, Jan decides to block. On the other hand, well, if you're Jan, you may be thinking, well, what's the worst that uh, can happen? If I block, then Scott will uh, have to uh, spend his, uh, his pump spell, which means that Scott may not have mana available to uh, add a creature to the board. And in addition to that, well, if uh, Scott uses his pump spell, that he, then he cannot uh, use it later on in the game. Still, Jan does read Scott for some kind of trick and just takes the damage. Note that uh, Scott would have two copies of, say, Strength of Arms in his deck, so that might have allowed him to uh, set up uh, well, a good tempo play with a pump spell. Same deal with uh, Confront the Unknown. Perhaps Jan did not want to uh, offer that. Well, as it turns out, the follow-up play was a Bloodbriar, so it wasn't as if Scott had nothing to do with his mana. Uh, meanwhile, Jan Xander does just pass things back here, and another attack coming from Scott Lip. This time looks like it will prompt a block from the young Czech player. Yeah, and this time Jan Xander has four mana up, so all kinds of uh, tricks could come out over here, even with, uh, with Madness. So Strength of Arms on the Bloodbriar there. We can see it there. Whenever a s another permanent is sacrificed, put a plus one, plus one counter on blood Bloodbriar. Well, this is the card that Jan was uh, probably afraid of on the previous turn. That said, it is uh, a little bit risky for Scott Lip to be playing this card in the face of all this open mana, because there are plenty of cards that uh, Jan could have to punish him uh, for that. Well, this is... Uh, a borrowed malevolence, so that's going to turn his Scourge deck supplicant into a 3 4 and turn the Blood Briar into, well, also a 3 4, so that uh, the two creatures effectively bounce. So he's sort of countered Strength of Arms, but the fact that there's a human being created by it as well means that it's not quite the, the full impact that he was looking for. Mm -hmm. 
with Escalate, costing a full three mana to give plus one, plus one, and minus one, minus one there. We see Borrowed Malevolence. And the follow-up play for Scott Lip here. Kind of an interesting one. Lupine Prototype. Well, it's not going to do anything yet, but once any player gets to Hellbent, that is, no cards uh, in hand, it can start attacking. Currently, Scott Lip still has two cards in hand. And he's a bit constrained on mana, given that he uh, has only found three lands so far. So that means that that Lupine Prototype is probably not going to become relevant uh, for the next couple of turns or so. That said, it could prove to be a potent attacker down the road. Citroen Scarb, MVP from last game, as the point man setting up with the assist to get <laughs> Emrakul into play. We will see whether or not that's going to happen for a second game in a row. In the meantime, of course, just a solid 3-1 fly. Yep. So now Scott Lip, on the one hand, he may want to equip one of his creatures so that it can uh, start attacking into the Tree Toughness Curse deck supplicant. On the other hand, he may want to uh, spend his mana to empty his hand in order to turn on that Lupine prototype. Note that at worst, Scott Lip could just attack with, say, Bloodbriar and Droxgul Shieldmate, and then Don Cassander will either, well, leave one of the two creatures unblocked, or trade it for uh, the Stitch Wing Scarp. Both of the situations seem reasonably fine for uh, for Scott Lip. Well, unless he is once again scared of uh, Stitch Wing Scarp dying, then discarding Embracool and being uh, returned with uh, Rise from the Grave. That uh, game one will probably still be fresh in his mind at this point. I mean, I'm not sure there's too much he can do about that. So he's just going to have to hope that he's got what he needs to be able to finish this game good and quick. The longer this game goes on, the more likely those sorts of scenarios become of simply being true. Uh, Scott Lip having uh, a good think about this uh, particular situation. As I mentioned, he could just uh, equip, say, his uh, Droxkull shield mate with uh, the cultist staff, attack with it, and then, well, John Cassander either has to uh, double block in an unfavorable trade or take four damage. But then again, uh, playing the cards from your hand to turn on the Lupine prototype in per well, perhaps the next turn is uh, quite valuable as well. Looks like he's uh, upgrading his 1 1 human into a 3 2 Eldrazi with uh, Extricator of Sin. Not yeah. too bad, also putting a counter on uh, Bloodbriar in the process. Yeah, I like this. Extricator of Sin, a solid one to have in play, and already an instant in the graveyard. Uh, potentially some creatures ending up there sometime fairly soon. If he does get to Delirium, then. The Extricator of Sin has the potential to get even better. In the meantime, the Bloodbriar getting a plus one, plus one counter, kind of big, meaning that it can attack in a little bit more easily. And here it looks like it's going to be taking down a um, Skizdark su Supplicant. But in the meantime, Extricator of Flesh, there we can see it. If the Extricator of Sin transforms, well, all the Eldrazi tokens in play get a bit better with Vigilance, and as does the Extricator itself, and you can start sacrificing non-Eldrazis to put more Eldrazi into play. Uh, still, for it to transform, Scottlip needs to uh, hit Delirium. Currently only instant and creature in his graveyard, so he's still uh, a long way off. That said, Scottlip is ahead this game. Way ahead on the battlefield, just by the number of creatures, power and toughness of his creatures, as well as a cultist staff that can uh, provide quite a boost over the course of, uh, of a long game. Jan Xander. Only a 3-1 flyer on the battlefield. Sure, it can start attacking, but Jan is already behind on the damage race. His game plan in this matchup will well, be to uh, defend early on and then hope to win in the late game with his uh, more powerful cards. Stitching Scarp, not really the best at uh, defending. Yeah, I mean, Jan Cassandra's deck, once it gets to the late game, does have some very powerful cards. We saw the, the first turning point in game one was the casting of Dark Salvation to make a couple of zombies and kill a creature. Just the kind of going big plays that Jan Cassander needs to stabilize, and then, you know, when he wins, he can win very big indeed. Uh, not this time around. He had to pass the turn with uh, six mana up. And there's a Lunark Mantle. Lunark Mantle, and then a Prey Upon, not just dealing with the one creature on Jan Cassander's side of the board, but also emptying Scott Lip's hand. That meaning that the attacks that come through here are going to be fairly special. And the Lupine prototype is getting in here. This is a lot of damage. Attack for 12 <laughs> with Jan Xander at 14 life. Kaboom. Well, better find something uh, to do with this Jan. Otherwise, 
you are unlikely to survive uh, the next combat step, even with a reanimated Ember Cool. A 1313 may be big, but if there is just too many creatures coming your way, even an Ember Cool can be overwhelmed. So Cassandra just weighing up the opportunity to get back his Stitchwing Scab here. Yeah, the Lupine prototype is uh, overperforming for Scott Lip in this top 8. It's a type of card that doesn't fit in any deck. Only uh, put it in if you have a relatively low curve. Not if you have all kinds of 6 or 7 drops that can get stuck in your hand. But in a deck like uh, Scott Lips with a low curve, well, now he has Hellbent. It also works well uh, as a creature for his uh, Prey Upon. So it's, it works well in his deck. Yeah, liking that one. And Yanka Sander here, he's in one of those sort of puzzling challenges. He had to discard Tamiyo there to his Stitchwing Scar. Basically didn't have the mana to cast her. And as it turns out, doesn't have the spells to cast to stay in this game. He scoops up his cards. This GP will come down to one final game. That one final game will be one where Yanka Sander's going first, if he chooses so. And it will be for the trophy. Yep, but these games have been uh, quite telling uh, so far. If uh, Scott Lip is able to hit this curve, then uh, use cards like uh, Prey Upon effectively. Looks like he has uh, he has the edge uh, so far. But if uh, Jan Xander finds uh, some of his powerful rares or mythics, then Jan Xander uh, has the edge. And in this particular game, Jan had uh, none of them. No Dark Salvation. We didn't get to see Tamiyo. No Ember Cool. Yeah, his deck uh, is not as good when uh, he doesn't find any of those cards. And likewise, when Jan Xander doesn't have excellent early game blockers, he's also uh, far behind against uh, the quite aggressive deck from, uh, from Scott Lip here. Looking at uh, Jan Xander's deck list, he doesn't even have all that many early game blockers. There's a Wailing Ghoul, a 1 3 for 2 mana, Skurs deck Supplicant, 2 3 for, uh, for 3 mana, a bunch of uh, late game and expensive uh, cards. And, well, Pale Rider of Trostad. If he finds that one on turn two, that could uh, prove to be quite a good blocker early on. But he will need some of these cards, I think, in order to keep up with uh, Jan Xander's deck. So a little bit more sideboarding going on for Jan Xander. He checked out a couple of little bits and pieces with the judges just in between games. Just wanted to make sure that he knew what was what there so that he made everything just as neat and clean as it can be in this final. It looks like he's fetching up a few additional lands that's what he's requesting from the judges adjusting his mana base in this final i mean his mana base has every potential to be quite complicated and actually there are quite a few good cards in green in jan sander's sideboard that he might be working with it may not even be uh, an adjustment of his mana base it may also be uh, an increase in his mana base when uh, when you are going to be on the play it can be uh, nice to have one extra land, especially when you have uh, a deck filled with powerful, expensive cards. Because when you're on the play, you, only you have well, one fewer draw step to assemble your mana base. So I've always uh, been happy to board in a land going up from 17 to 18 when I'm on the play. And this may also be a strategy that uh, Jan Xander is uh, implementing here right now. Because he will definitely need to uh, hit his land drops. Scott Lip's deck is not going to give him uh, any amount of time to, uh, to stumble. It's interesting. I mean, that's an idea that I actually hadn't really considered before uh, in terms of sideboarding. Specifically in Limited, obviously in Constructed, your sideboard is the 15 cards that you have brought with you specifically for that purpose. So any lands that you want to bring in have to be there. But in, uh, in Draft, in Sealed Deck, any of the cards that you've opened, they are your sideboard. But additionally, any number of Reg the regular five basics are available to you too. Uh, wastes, of course, you do need to have them in your pool or draft them to be able to put yep. them in. As, as many as you want. Hey, you can even uh, board up to a 5,000 card deck if, uh, if you want. Best this of luck uh, shuffling it though. Uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a problem. Though it, it, it is a strategy that uh, sometimes comes up against uh, a deck that tries to mill you out. That's not really a strategy that uh, we see in Eldritch Moon Limited, but uh, it has happened over, uh, over the course of the game. As for strategies in this uh, format in general, we've seen all kinds of uh, nice color combinations and synergies doing work, ranging from uh, the, the red-white Spells Matter deck with uh, Thermo Alchemist, Ingenious Cop, 
getting all kinds of bonuses from uh, just playing spells. We've seen the, the green-black Delirium decks, you know, something like a Traben Foulblood, a creature that gets a boost when you have Delirium, as well as a Grapple with the past. But in the end here, it's uh, blue-black versus uh, green-white. Not so much decks really focused around, uh, around synergies all that much, just solid cards, and that is still perfectly fine as uh, evidenced by the finals appearance of these two players. You can see a little smile on Jan Cassandra's face, face there. Not disheartened by having lost the second game here. He knows he's still got one shot left at lifting the trophy and shuffling up in the hope that he's going to be able to make the most of those little changes that he's made to his deck and pull it out here in this what will be the very last game of GP Sydney. Mm -hmm. For those of you that are enjoying Eldritch Moon Limited, I mean, there's going to be more magic going on this weekend. I mean, the GP that's going on here, there are GPs going on in both Sto uh, Stockholm in Sweden and in Montreal, Canada. They'll be covered on the text side of our website if you want to find out what's going on there. And of course, tune back in on Friday as the Pro Tour starts here in Sydney. And in fact, if you're in the US, effectively, it'll be Thursday night <laughs> that the Pro Tour starts in Sydney. Yeah, time um, zones are a tricky thing. Oh, yeah. Tell that to my body right now. It has <laughs> absolutely no idea what time it is. Oh, yeah. And for uh, many of the pros who uh, flew all the way over here to uh, to Sydney, many of them have been uh, fighting through, uh, through jet lag in order to uh, get through these uh, two days of uh, competition. But the final game, jet lag or no, is getting underway. Well, we didn't see any mulligans, which is a great start. Um, Scott Lip though was able to put up a good showing in both games in spite of uh, mulligans for games one and two. Nagging thoughts. I would just love to see Emrakul being put into the graveyard here, ready for uh, Rise from the Grave, but just a swamp, as uh, Jan Xander, I believe, picked up a swamp for uh, for his hand. Lone Rider. Well, this is the 1-1 one, one lifelink that whenever you gain three life over the course of one turn, it'll transform into it that rides as one. I love these names. Uh, which would be quite a menacing 4-4 four, four, uh, Trample Lifelink first strike, but Scott Lib will have to gain 3 life or actually <laughs> keep his creature around in the first place. Yeah, Boon of Emrakul, that's the first time we've seen it in this match. Uh, dealing with it that rides it as one, or I guess Lone Rider at the point that he used it on it. Emrakul team deck confirmed. Crow of Dark Tidings putting more cards into the graveyard. We now have Enchantment, Instant, Land, and uh, creature in the graveyard. So Delirium active, and, and as far as Emrakul's concerned, Delirium is only the beginning. The, as many card types as you want to get in the graveyard will all reduce the cost of Emrakul, the promised end. Yeah, it would cost nine mana as it stands right now. So there's a courageous outrider. Is there a human in the top four of Scott Lib's library? It looks like there might be. He's just having a little look and a think, which signals that possibly there's more than one. He's trying to choose the best one for the situation. So far, Scott Lip is uh, getting ahead in this game. He hit his curve of a 2-drop, 3-drop, 4-drop. Young Xander was forced to use a 3-mana removal spell to deal with a 2-mana creature. So Young Xander uh, missed basically a mana on the exchange. And now the Crow of Dark Tidings that uh, Jan has put on the battlefield, it's pretty much irrelevant against the high toughness uh, creatures from uh, from Scott Lip. So Scott ultimately chose Extricator of Sin there as the creature to put into his hand off that effect. So he's now passed the turn back. Uh, Jan can now try to enter a damage race by attacking with his Crow of Dark Titans, but this deck is not really set up to be uh, winning any damage races. Typically Jan would be uh, trying to defend early on and then win the late game with uh, more powerful cards. And well, when it comes to damage races, the board is not looking all that favorable for Jan Xander here yet. But let's see what he uh, what he adds. Terrarium, eh, also not really the card he needs to uh, to stabilize. There yeah. will be five power coming his way on the next attack. Yeah, Terrarium, very much a sort of long game card. It doesn't do anything the turn it comes into play. Yes, it represents an artifact in the graveyard, which will be great <laughs> in terms of getting that Emrakul cheaper. Yes, it represents mana fixing, which is great in terms of casting Tamiyo, but the turn you play it, well, effectively, you've just invested some time in getting it into play for future turns. When you sacrifice it, you do get to draw a card. Uh, but there's the Extricator of Sin that Scott Lip revealed last turn. And sacrificing a forest, making a 
Eldrazi Horror Token. And there is the Lutwin prototype, gradually getting rid of cards in hand. Scott Lip, though, it's going to take him a little bit more if he's going to be attacking with that 5-5 anytime soon. That said, he is emptying his hand quite rapidly. Wouldn't be surprised to uh, see an attack by the Lupine prototype in, say, two turns. That is at least something that uh, Jan Xander has to worry about right now, but it's not the only thing that uh, Jan has to be worried about. There's a lot of power coming his way. Jan really needs to uh, put down some defenses, because that Crow of Dark Titans by itself, it's not going to win a damage race, not even close. It will likely stay behind as a fine blocker for the 3-2 Eldrazi token, but Jan still needs to uh, add some additional defenses if he wants to uh, stay in this game. He may have to uh, think about what's in his deck before sacrificing uh, Terrarion. Also, perhaps if he sacrifices it now uh, and then draws Tamiyo later in the game, he may not have uh, the mana to, uh, to cast it. So, plenty of uh, options that he has to think about before committing to a play. Yeah, we don't know quite how much white mana he has access to after sideboarding because we know that he was adjusting his mana base just a little bit. Well, Dark Salvation would be uh, would still be quite good here, the card that he uh, had in the first game. But given that he didn't play it on uh, on turn five, I don't expect him to be uh, having it here. Emra Cool. Well, after the Terrarion, it would cost eight mana, so still a little bit off. Getting close, but Scott Lip is not going to give Jan Xander a lot of time in order to uh, put down Emra Cool on the battlefield. So, Xander does crack the Terrarion. Draws a card. Uh, keeping his cards close to his chest. Not letting anyone get uh, get a peek at him. And Jan has been really praised by uh, his Czech compatriots uh, so far for his playing skill. Hasn't been playing for a long time, but is bursting on the scene with uh, an excellent finish. And there is Tamio. All right. Planeswalker is down, but it will only uh, provide a temporary uh, measure as, sure, he can lock down those two attackers, then still have Crow of Dark Tidings to uh, block the Eldrazi token. But so far, it doesn't really gain him any uh, permanent advantage. Yeah, Tamiyo, the plus one ability to give curiosity to a couple of creatures, certainly powerful. Uh, but kind of you need the luxury of being a little bit ahead there. The middle ability, sometimes it's also powerful when you're ahead. It can be, as we've seen here, pretty reasonable when you're behind also, just buying you a little bit of time to get out of a situation. But Yank Sander doesn't have all that much time, even in spite of Tamiyo. He really does need to draw into something good very quickly, though mm. I guess that if Tamiyo goes to the graveyard, that is another card type <laughs> for Emrakul. All right, getting closer, getting closer. That is, uh, we, we could actually... Could we see Emrakul on the next turn? There are now five different card types in the graveyard. If the Planeswalker also gets there, and John Xander has a land and Emrakul in hand, that's still a lot of different things that have to go uh, go right. Well, it is possible. So Lunark Mantle on the Eldrazi token. If uh, Jan wants to uh, protect either his life total or Tamiyo, he will have to uh, jump block it. Also the Extricator of Sin is getting in, possibly signifying a pump spell. Yep, yep, there it is. No equipment in play this time, so it's just a straightforward plus two, plus two. But I say just t plus two, plus two will do it. Yeah, assuming that uh, the Extricator of Sin was attacking Tamiyo, that will take down the Planeswalker. Two cards going to the graveyard when Crow of Dark Tiding dies. Yeah, Jan is in very bad shape here, unless he manages to play Land Emrakul, which is within the realm of possibility. I'm sure that's also what's going uh, through Scott Lip's uh, mind at this point. Yeah, he's carefully checking out graveyards. We have creature, land, artifact, instant, sorcery, and planeswalker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, pretty much everything you can assemble in uh, a game of Limited. But, no, just root evil. That, uh, that must be a sideboard card. Oh, very uh, much being so. Being brought in. We'll take down the Lupine prototype and allow him to investigate. 
or root out uh, rather. So it looks like uh, it might be that Scott Lip is considering sacrificing the Lupin prototype to the Lumina to the mantle here, just so that there's not the investigation from root out. He can recognise that his opponent is digging wherever possible and doesn't really want that to happen. Yeah, so it's uh, a nice answer to one of the threats on uh, Scott Lip's side of the board, but well, there's still plenty of power going to come his way, and now also, wow, there's uh, suddenly delirium. Which means that uh, we will have a transformation. Yeah, so now those Eldrazi tokens and indeed the Extricator of Malice, uh, oh sorry, Extricator of Flesh, uh, has got Vigilance. So two of these Eldrazi coming in the Vigilance, the other two creatures just regular yeah, style. It's, it's and there's 13. the handshake. It's 13 on this turn, fitting <laughs> for an Emrakul deck. And John actually didn't ha even have Embercool in hand. He did have Rice uh, from the grave, but congratulations to Scott Lip, champion of Grand Prix Sydney. Yeah, we see a number of his teammates from Team East West Bowl coming across to congratulate him. Uh, Seth Manfield had actually been watching the match kind of on our monitors just so he could see everything that was going on. And I'm sure that he will be one of the many East West Bowl players keen to congratulate Scott Lip, who has just put in up a fantastic performance. He finished top of the Swiss to make it into this top eight and was able to parlay that it, with his pretty sort of straightforward fighty green white deck and got there able to win the entire shebang here in Sydney and what a great start to his trip to Sydney we that's the end of what we've got coming on from here we will hopefully be able to get an interview with him with BDM but Tim Willoughby and uh, Frank Carsten we will pass things over so that we can get that conversation soon enough yeah but what an exciting <laughs>